I have a copy of all the meanings of the symbols of Revelation. Now, I'm happy to send you a copy. If you will text your... Here's my telephone number. If you will text me at 704-965-4442 and say, send me the symbols, I will send you a two-page list of the symbols of Revelation and what they mean so that you can have them in your hands as we study for the next 24 weeks. Again, if you're on the internet or driving, 704-965-4442. And this is a two-page list of the symbols in Revelation that we will be talking about for the next 24 weeks. Do you know that over a million Bibles are printed each year? There are over 80,000 different versions of the Bible in many different languages. And the sales of Bibles are about $425 million each year. Now, with this many Bibles being sold, wouldn't you think that everybody would be a Bible scholar, that everybody would be reading and studying? The book that's the least read or studied is the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. What time are they talking about? Because the time of the end, the time of Jesus' return, is near. Now, that's interesting. While we know Jesus is coming soon, it's been 2,000 years since he was here on earth, but for you and me, the day we die, it's our fate is sealed for us, true? So for us, the time is when we die if he doesn't come while we're still living. So many people put off salvation or thinking about it. But really we should think about it because we do not know what will happen between now and tomorrow morning. So blessed are those that read it and take it to heart what is written in the book of Revelation, and that's what we're going to do for the next 24 weeks. Revelation is not a secretive book that nobody can understand. It is the revelation, it says, of Jesus Christ. Ask yourself, why would Jesus Christ reveal himself purposely in a book and obscure the meaning, so that nobody can understand it. Would that make any sense to any of you? Why, why would Jesus do that? However, the book does use symbols, and we're going to look at those symbols over the next 24 weeks. Again, I'm going to say, text me if you would like to have those symbols. Let me give you my number one more time, 704 965 4442, and I'll send you the list of symbols. Okay, why would Jesus use symbols? He showed John visions, and he dictated the book to him. Because Jesus plainly stated, if he plainly stated the facts, if 2,000 years ago, Jesus had plainly stated what was going to happen, I guarantee you, the book would have been burned and destroyed years ago. The symbols protected the knowledge that God wanted us to have down through the ages, revealing it as necessary in the course of history. Furthermore, God's angel commanded that this book not be sealed in Revelation 22:10. 10. 
Because some of the most important messages that God has ever given to mankind are found in Revelation. It is an open book. It's an open book for the time of the end, just before Jesus comes. Revelation 22, 10 to 12. You know, like an acorn, a tiny little nut, embodies the mighty oak tree, the book of Revelation is similar. It embodies all of the knowledge of the entire Bible. It, 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 it glorifies, extends the main themes of the Bible. Seminars are very popular today. You can find a seminar on almost anything. But this seminar, for the next 24 weeks at 10 a.m. every Saturday morning, will make an impact on your life that you'll never forget. Because this seminar, if we study, brings us face to face with Jesus in a really startling manner. This book will stop us in our tracks and we will see him in a new and wonderful way. It really is the book of the Bible that has impacted my life probably the most. It's the book that has made me understand that I will stand up and stand for Jesus regardless of what happens. It will provide a new understanding of history. The history in Revelation is from when Jesus died on the cross, was resurrected, returned to heaven with the promise of returning and bringing us sin into sin and saving us for all eternity. The book of Revelation is from that point until Jesus returns. That's the history. That's the period of history that we find in Revelation. It will also provide us an understanding of why things are happening the way they are in our world today. If you understand Revelation and you watch the news, it is perfectly clear what is happening. We know, for example, that America is going to fall. We know this. Revelation says it. We're going to learn all of these things as we go through this series. And we'll understand where we're heading. We'll understand that Earth's battles are not between Trump and Biden. The battles going on are not between the Republicans and the Democrats. Do you know how many people are caught up in Republicans and Democrats? and this person and that person. The battle, this is a spiritual battle, and it's going on between Christ and Satan. And yes, Satan works through institutions and people, and we're going to see clearly how Satan works through institutions. It is very clearly outlined in Revelation. And we're going to see how Satan works through humans. Revelation will unveil the events that are going to take place just before Jesus returns. And we need not be surprised. It's going to lead us to make what I consider to be momentous decisions in our lives. We see the spiritual and we're going to want and desire to be on the Lord's side. You see, I've come to the point, and I know some of you have heard me say this, where it is dumb to sin. It's dumb. Why do we deliberately do anything that would keep us out of God's heaven? There's a war going on, and that Satan wants our soul. He's playing for keeps, and so is Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is not going to force us to love him and serve him. But we need a knowledge base to love him. We need, a, we need to understand scripture so that we will understand how much he loved us and in turn 
we give him our allegiance, our loyalty, and our love. Our lessons are going to point out some things with which we might disagree, especially about church history. When we present Revelation, there are always people who say, I've been in church all my life, I've never heard that. And my preacher has a PhD from blankety blank theology school, and he's never said that, and I don't know that I can believe you. So I'm going to invite you not to believe me. My assistant is Sierra Hernandez. She's the head elder of our church. And I invite you not to believe Sierra. Don't believe us. Look up everything we say. Prove it for yourselves. Because if you study what we say and study history, check it out. Then you're going to understand why we're saying it. You're going to agree with why we're saying it. And you're going to become a really good Bible student. Don't shut your mind. Don't say, you know, my, grand, my great-grandmama dedicated this land. My grandpapa gave this land to put this church on here. And we've been going to this church for generations. And my grandmama kept Sunday. And my mama kept Sunday. And my daddy kept Sunday. And I'm going to keep Sunday. And y'all can't tell me anything different. If that's your attitude then Satan already has you signed, sealed, and delivered. Open your minds to Bible truth. Let the Bible speak to you. You've heard me say this many times, and I stick by it. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what your preacher believes. It doesn't matter what your grandma and your grandpa and your mommy and your daddy believe. It doesn't matter what I believe. It only matters what the Word of God says. If the Word of God says it, we believe it. If the word of God doesn't say it, then you have, we can have our own opinions about it. It only matters what God says. This book of Revelation was given to the last living apostle, John. You'll remember that John was probably 13 or 14 years old. He was Jesus' cousin. You remember, Jesus' mama and John's mama were sisters, Salome and Mary. So Jesus died probably when John was somewhere around 40. Now it's 100 AD, so it, John is up probably in his 90s. He's an old man. You'll remember that at the cross, Jesus looked at John and said, Behold your mother, remember that? So John, we know, took her to Ephesus, where she lived until she died. We've been to Ephesus. You can see, or they say, that's where she lived and where John died. He's the oldest living apostle. Now, this book was given to him by Jesus Christ. And I think you're going to find that Revelation can only be understood with the help of the Holy Spirit by people willing to pray for guidance. It is a spiritual book that is spiritually discerned. This seminar is going to help you understand that both Jesus and Satan want our worship. Satan wants us to worship him. He wanted Jesus to worship him. That was the problem in heaven, was everybody was worshiping God. Satan is a covering cherub. He, he was jealous he wanted the adoration and worship of the angels. The tragedy, the tragedy in my opinion, is that there are millions of people honoring Satan, worshiping Satan, and they don't even know it. Revelation sounds an awesome warning against worshiping Satan, and it shows us how to avoid it. Now, this seminar, we're going to teach the broad, basic, main points so that you can study on your own, so you can read, so you can have the symbols and understand the book for yourself. We're also going to understand why so many priests and pastors and rabbis ignore the book. They don't know the symbols. They've never learned them. And I, again, want to emphasize, Revelation is studied 
with prayer, with prayer and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now let's take a quick review of the book of Revelation. In chapter one, the hero of the book or the star of the book is introduced and it is Jesus Christ. Chapters two and three, we're gonna read Christ's messages to the seven churches. They're the seven literal Christian churches that were established after Jesus' death. And the message was written by John through the power of the Holy Spirit to each of those churches. But each message to those churches had a double meaning. And it has meaning for the the last days of earth's history. We're going to study that. Chapters 4 and 5, we read of the opening of a mysterious scroll. It's held by Jesus in his hand. And as he opens each of the seals, an event happens on this earth. And it's a really cool study, I think. And again, it gives you church history. In chapters 6 and 7, we'll study the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And everybody's heard that. They've made movies and then so forth and so on. And we'll also read about the sealing of God's people. We'll learn that each one of the horses unleashed by one of the seals that Jesus opens, symbolic language, is a different period of Christian history. It's really interesting. In chapters 8 and 9, we're going to learn about the seven trumpets. They're sounded by seven angels. And the events that follow each trumpet are described in detail. And the seven trumpets sound when Jesus breaks the seventh seal of the scroll. And it's, again, really, really interesting. In chapters 4 and 5, chapter 10, this is a prophecy that refers to the end of the 2400-year prophecy of Daniel 14. And this has a very great impact on the Adventist church. And we're going to learn the prophecy, the 2400-year prophecy. And we'll find that Daniel and Revelation are twin books. Both of them contain, in different formats, the very same end-time prophecies. Although Daniel wrote 600 years before John. Chapter 11 are the two witnesses in sackcloth. Now, there have been all kinds of interpretations, but this refers to the 1260 days of the Inquisition of the church, also known as the Dark Ages, when both the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, were withheld from the people. In fact, You were persecuted if you had a copy in any way, shape, or form of the Bible. You'll remember the Waldensians. Remember the story of how they copied Scripture, hid it in their garments, came down out of the mountain, and tried to find somebody they could share pieces of the Scripture with. You know, we're sitting here today. My guess would be every one of you have more than one Bible in your house. Is that true? Has anybody only got one Bible? And some of you probably have more like 10 or 15 of all different. Really? I think I have 55. I counted one day. That are, that are you know, various translations and so forth. How many of us would copy little pieces, hide it on our body, risking death to go share one of the Psalms with somebody? See, we have grown so comfortable in our air conditioning, in our automobiles, in our comfortable beds, that we don't even have a 
concept of what it means to share Jesus Christ when somebody's life and salvation is in the balance. God's direct witnesses in this earth are that Old and New Testament, his word. Chapter 12, we'll study the mysterious woman standing on the moon, reflecting the light of the sun. In chapter 12, we're going to learn there was war in heaven. You see, there are people who think all of heaven is perfect. There's nothing in heaven that isn't perfect. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. There was war in that peaceful place where God dwells. And that war is continuing till Jesus comes again. And it's a fascinating study until Jesus comes and makes all of it right. Chapter 13. Chapter 13 is a chapter that really upsets a lot of people. It's about the mark of the beast and the mysterious number 666. There's nobody in this world that hasn't heard of the mark of the beast. Everybody knows about it. But few know what it means. And Satan has worked hard to obscure the meaning. We're going to learn when it happened, how it happened, and how it's going to affect people of the world and in our future. Just before we began the seminar today, we were talking back here, which made me kind of late starting, about the mask mandate. And you can say it about other things, about the cancel culture, about the woke culture, about forces of government attempting to control the common man, people. And I'm telling you the book of Revelation is going to tell us that this will increase to the point where we will not be able to buy or sell unless we go along to get along. So all of us are going to have a make us, we're going to have to make a decision. And this next 24 weeks is the perfect time to decide. We're going to have to make a decision if we will go along to get along, if we will give in to keep peace. What will you do to keep peace? And will you stand for God though the heavens fall? And that's what the book of Revelation gives us the power, the understanding to do. How does it give us the power and understanding to do that? Because as we study these lessons, we're going to study how it ends. How if we stand firm, this is going to be the outcome. If we give in, this is going to be the outcome. So that at the end of these studies, we will have a very clear understanding of why it's important that we stick to God's word no matter what anybody is telling us to do. And revelation affects our future and our outcome. Chapter 14. We're going to learn three messages. Three warning messages. This is the last Warning message God is going to give to the world in chapter 14 of Revelation. It's the last. This is it. It's God's last words to humanity. And if you ignore the three messages of Revelation, you simply will not be in heaven. This is extremely clear in Revelation. And there is a dire warning Nobody can read Revelation 14 and laugh, I'll tell you that. It is a serious message of warning, warning that if you worship the beast and his image, you will be cast into a lake of fire. So it's extremely important that we understand those sobering last warning three angels messages. And if you look 
at our window, stained glass window behind me, you will see three angels. Do you see them? Representing God's last warning message to the world. And they put the stained glass window up there when they built the church in 1973. The warning is so important that we have it embedded in stained glass behind me. Chapter 15 and 16, we can call the grapes of wrath because God tells us in these chapters the fate of those who follow Satan. And let me tell you, God spells out the consequences for apostasy very, very clearly. Nobody will ever come before God's throne and say, but you didn't tell me. Oh God, if you had told me that, I would have followed you. No, no, God has made it extremely clear to every human on this earth. You can turn your back on it. You can not listen to it. But it is written clearly for us to understand. In chapters 17 and 18, we're going to learn about spiritual Babylon. And the Bible calls it the great harlot, the great prostitute. In the Bible, the church is called God's bride. A prostitute is a false religious system who has turned her back on her husband. She turned, she turned her back on Jesus Christ and you followed another lover, Satan. Revelation clearly points out the choices, the decisions that you and I must make if we want to be saved. Chapter 19, the rider, these are the horses, the rider on the white horse defeats the beast, meaning Jesus Christ wins the war that began in heaven when Satan rebelled. This is the great news of Revelation. The beast, the dragon, the serpent are some of the names given to Satan. Chapter 20 of Revelation is all about the millennium. That 1,000 years when all of the wicked dead, along with all the wicked who were destroyed by the brightness of Jesus coming, remain dead on this earth. And Satan is confined to this earth for 1,000 years while the saints are in heaven. It's such an exciting chapter. It debunks the popular theory, uh, uh, the rapture theory, that has taken the world sort of by storm with the Left Behind series of books and movies, which is absolutely not scriptural. Chapter 21 and 22 tell us about the city of God, the New Jerusalem, and gives us details about the new heavens and the new earth that God will create for those who love him. You see, there's no need to be ignorant about the wonderful things God has laid out that's happening. It's carefully laid out in scripture. All we have to do is study it. And each Saturday morning at 10 a.m. for 24 weeks, we're going to present action-packed biblical information. And we hope you're going to join us, be right here, study with us, bring your friends, ask us questions if there's anything you don't understand. Here's a key to the book of Revelation. Of the 404 verses, all right, Revelation has 404 verses. 276 of them come directly from the Old Testament. All right, did you understand that? Over half the verses in Revelation come from the Old Testament. Therefore, we're going to allow portions of Scripture from the Old Testament to interpret Revelation. We unlock Revelation's prophecies and symbols by finding out what the Bible writers had to say on the same subject. John, again, on the Isle of Patmos, wrote the book of Revelation. 
Isle of Patmos, Revelation 1, 9, Isle of Patmos is in the Aegean Sea. He had been banished by Emperor Domitian. Because of his faith, he was forced to work in the mines, history says, as punishment. It was the Alcatraz of that day, an island prison. Now, what does the Bible say about studying scripture? John 5, 39. You study the scriptures diligently because in them, basically, you have eternal life. Because these are the scriptures that are going to tell you about me, Jesus said. It's scripture where we find the information about Jesus. Luke 24, 25, and 27. He said unto them, this is Jesus talking, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures. Now, concerning himself. Now, I'm telling you this because there are many people today who say, I don't do the Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. Have you heard that? I only do the New Testament. And the new covenant. I have an aunt who's no longer living. And she used to say to me, oh, you Adventist, you're so into the Old Testament. I only believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I always enjoyed saying, Aunt Betty, Jesus quoted the Old Testament. Why can't I? You know, because I just like to argue with her. Jesus quoted the Old Testament, did he not? Is that the only scripture Jesus had? So why would we dismiss it? I don't know. 1 Corinthians 2.13 said, This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The Bible says spiritual things are spiritually discerned. This is why I want to emphasize again, that we study revelation with prayer and we study asking for the power of the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds. And God always honors our prayers. The Old Testament gives us the keys to studying revelation. Isaiah 28, 9 and 10, to whom will he preach knowledge? To whom will he explain the message? For it is precept upon precept. Line upon line, here a little, there a little. This is how we study the scripture. What does that mean? That means we search the scripture. We search this passage of scripture. Where else in the Bible does it say this? And what's the context as we read it? The Bible, it doesn't read like a novel. You cannot sit down and just start reading the Bible through like you read Gone with the Wind. The Bible wasn't meant to be read that way. The Bible was meant to be studied. It was meant to be read line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. This part of our lesson is about how to understand the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation passed through five steps to reach us. And what are they? The first step is God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to the angel. The angel gave it to John. John wrote it down. John sent it out to all the seven churches. Isn't it amazing that God wanted us 2,000 years later to know and understand what the book says? It's not a closed book beyond our intelligence. It was given to us. It held a message for those living in John's day. It's got a message for us today. They are dual prophecies which only God could do. And God did because it kept Satan from destroying the book. It would have been destroyed by the, during the Inquisition so fast we wouldn't have a bit of it today if it weren't written in symbols. Number two, God promises a special blessing to those who do these three things. Revelation 1-3. Blessed are those who read aloud the words of this prophecy. Now, that's always amused me, but if you look at the context and you go back in history and look at the culture, many people couldn't read 
in that day. So God is pouring a blessing on those who would read it aloud so that others could learn it. And blessed are those who hear it. And third, take to heart what is written in it. Believe what is written in it. I've always been intrigued by the blessings to people that study Revelation. Whom did Jesus say the scriptures reveal in John 5, 39? Jesus said, those scriptures testify of me. If we want to know Jesus, if we want to live close to him, there's no possible way you can do it without studying the scripture. You know, I, I speak to people, I go visit people in the hospital, and my first question to them is, do you know Jesus? What is your relationship with Jesus? And I have people that have haven't been in church. When's the last time you were in church? Oh, probably 20 years ago. I'm going to tell you, if you were in church 20 years ago and you haven't read the Bible one day in 20 years, you don't know Jesus. You're fooling yourself. And you're laying in the hospital bed about to die. And I'm not the one you want at your bedside because I'm going to tell you real quick, no, no, you need to bow your head and ask forgiveness for your sins. You see, the Bible is what tells us about God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. All the information we need for salvation is right in the Bible. When explaining prophecy, what approach did Jesus use? Luke 24, 25 to 27. And we just read this, the beginning he started with Moses. He started at the beginning. All the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. He pointed out to people what the Bible writers said about him. Why? Because the Bible explains itself. Again, our opinions don't count. It only counts what the Word of God says. Of the 39 Old Testament books, Revelation quotes verses from 26 of them. That's a large number of Old Testament books. For example, quotes from the Old Testament in the first five chapters of Revelation, to me, are amazing. Chapter 1 has 27 quotes from the Old Testament. Chapter 2 has 15 quotes. Chapter 3, 13 quotes. Chapter 4, 16 quotes. Chapter 5, 14 quotes, all from the Old Testament. So keep in mind, as we unlock Revelation's prophecies and symbols, we're going to look at what other Bible writers say on the same subject. This part of the lesson today is about communication by symbols in the book of Revelation. All right, I'm going to pause here and tell you one more time in case you came in late or tuned in late. I have a two pages of all the symbols of Revelation and what they mean. If you text me, I will send you those two pages. You text me at 704-965-4442, and I will send you the symbols so that you can study along with us. Revelation 1.1, what does it say the angel did to the message of Revelation as he gave it to John? He signified it. What does that mean? Signify means communicate. He communicated it by signs and tokens and symbols. So revelation is presented in symbolic language so nobody can destroy it before the end of the earth when we need the messages. How does Revelation 1-1 say that God presented the message of Revelation to his servant John? He showed it to him, the things which must directly come to pass. In fact, we're going to see several times in Revelation where the heavens were opened and John saw in vision and wrote down what he saw. We're going to find one place in Revelation where seven thunders were uttered to John. And John was told, don't write it. And every time I read it, I want to go. Because I would like to know what the seven thunders were. But John was told not to tell us, so I guess I didn't need to know. We're going to see 
John saw who was saved. We're going to study that. I can tell you exactly who's going to be saved. Want to hear it? Do you remember? He saw multitudes standing on a sea of glass. Now, it's not glass. It just looked like bright and shining glass to him. And he said, here are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. That's who's going to be saved. Keep the commandments of God, have the faith of Jesus. You're going to hear John say, I saw, I beheld 73 times in Revelation. It's really important to understand that in Revelation, God is presenting religious bodies and movements, nations, historical time periods, past and future events, as well as Satan and his evil work, and he's going to present it in word pictures, almost like a cartoon gallery for us. Number seven, why did Jesus speak in parables and clothe the book of Revelation in symbols? I've all, Luke 8, 10, I've already said this to you, but Jesus said that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Does this sound like Jesus didn't want you to know? No, Jesus is talking about the wicked. He's talking about the people that would destroy it had they have understood it. He spoke in parables so that the spiritually minded could understand. He clothed revelation in symbols so only those sincerely praying and seeking could understand. The enemies of God in Revelation are unmasked. And they're unmasked in pretty definite language. Centuries ago, those very same enemies would literally have destroyed the word. But symbols shouldn't hinder us. We know what the symbols mean today. We're going to study that 2400-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14 because it has been fulfilled. We're going to learn about the 1,260 year period of the Inquisition prophesied by God 600 years before it happened. This part of our lesson discusses the authority of Bible prophecy and how reliable the words of prophecy are. 2 Peter 1, 16 and 19, Peter said, we have not followed fables. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Peter says we walked and talked with him. We were there with Jesus Christ. And in addition to being with Jesus Christ, we know prophecy. There were over 125 prophecies about Jesus coming as the Messiah that all came true. So Peter is telling his followers, look, we walked and talked with him. We saw his majesty. Peter was there at the transfiguration of Christ. And if you don't believe that, understand we got the prophecies about him. How can we not believe as we read these accounts? God gives two warnings in regards to interpreting prophecy. What are they? First, no prophecy gets a private interpretation by somebody. I know a woman who lives in another part of the country who prayed for visions. They invited us to their home one Sabbath for lunch, and she wanted to share with me that she had been diligently praying that God would use her as a prophet. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm in this woman's house eating lunch, my, my husband and I. And I looked at her and said, are you out of your mind? Because you know I'm so careful with what I say. And she said, oh no, oh no, I think it would be wonderful to prophesy for God. I was shocked. I said, do you know what they do to prophets? You better be careful what you pray for. Because most of the prophets I know were killed are you sure you're willing 
to be burned at the stake? Oh, well, there are prophets that weren't killed. I'm just praying diligently. Um, I don't know about you, but you can't volunteer to be a prophet. God calls who God wants when God wants them. And everyone he calls generally says, oh, not me, Lord. Isaiah said, not me. I'm a man of unclean lips, which makes me wonder if he cursed. I mean, you know, what, what does that mean? God calls us. So when we study Revelation, understand John didn't say, me, me, Lord. I'll write it down for you. God called John. And Jesus spoke through John. And we are not to add or take away from the words of any prophecy. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. We aren't to teach it in our own way or, or speak it for ourselves. This is why I said earlier, when I'm teaching or Sierra is teaching, don't believe us. You'll hear Sierra say the same thing. Don't believe us. Study and prove what we're saying. Go home and look it up. Study history. Study the prophecy. If we say something and you say, that can't possibly be right. I've never heard that before in my life. Go study it. Since God says that revelation is not now and never has been sealed, why in the world do people feel that it's a closed, sealed book, impossible to understand. Isaiah 29, 10 to 14. It says, these people come near me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. Is that true? Do a lot of people know only the Bible they've learned in Sunday school? They've never picked it up for themselves? Yes, this is very true. Many believe they will be saved in their sins. I, don't, I can't even begin to tell you how many people I know that are living together, unmarried, who believe they've got a relationship with God and they'll be saved. I ran into somebody who asked me for counsel, and I said, separate, either get married or get out of the relationship, because you do not know God. Yes, I do. God is my best friend. That's, I'm sorry, but you're deceiving yourself. Am I right or not? You're deceiving yourself. Do not believe for one minute that you can be saved in your sin. You must Reject the sin. Yes, it may take you years to get over the sin, but you must, with the help of God, quit the sin that is destroying you from within. When we come to worship, we come humbly with every sin forgiven. You know, when we come in here on Sabbath morning, I hope you've prepared your heart. I hope last night you were on your knees. I hope you said, Lord, tomorrow... As we worship, humble my heart, forgive my sins. Let me absorb the message that you have for me tomorrow. That's the only way we should walk in the door. And I'll tell you something. I am terrified to stand in this pulpit and preach without every sin forgiven. I'm afraid. And if you ever hear me preach, you'll see me stand here and pray before I do anything and open my mouth. Have you, have you seen me do that? because I'm scared because God is holy and one of the things Revelation shows us is his holiness and what he thinks of sin and how he's going to take sin from this world Isaiah 29, 13, and 14 says, Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will, be per will perish. The intelligent of the intelligent will vanish. You see, we will never understand revelation just because we're curious, just because we're smart, just because we have a PhD. 
Revelation can only be understood when we submit ourselves to God, when in humility we ask God to show us what he wants us to learn. I can tell you, actually I can promise you, that you're going to find it very, very difficult to study each week with us. And if you don't believe me, remember this as we go through the weeks. Satan will do anything in his power to prevent you from learning, to prevent, prevent you from attending or listening. He doesn't want the information known by us. How much is scripture inspired as we study 2 Timothy 3.16? And we all know this. All scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful to teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training us in righteousness. Why? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. If we twist the scriptures to our own opinions and preferences, what can be the result? 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. His, this is Paul's letters, contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort. That's pretty clear, isn't it? As they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. The Bible is clear in several places that God simply will destroy people who do not preach clearly the scriptures. This part of our lesson discusses four important keys to understanding the Bible. First, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. If we have any other motivation for studying, we're wrong. Second, we must thirst for the truth. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Do we come to church out of habit? Do we bother studying the word of God? Do we thirst? Like when you're so thirsty for a drink you can hardly stand it? That's how we need to feel about studying the scripture. Third, we test the Bible. We test all beliefs by the teachings of the Bible. If we know this Bible for ourselves, no power on earth can turn our minds away from it. We will know what is being said. The fourth key to understanding the Bible is this. If any man will do his will, he will know the doctrine, whether it be of God. First, uh, Revelation 1, 3, John 7, 17. Here's the thing I said to somebody that I've been texting and emailing with quite a bit. And she's confused. she hasn't attended here yet. She's just studying. And she said to me, well, I'm just not sure about the Sabbath. Because my friend says it was that old law was nailed to the cross. All right, how do you respond to that? Here's the thing. If you get on your knees and you say, God, show me the truth. Show me the truth. I want to do your will. What's going to happen? You're going to know, aren't you? Because God, Holy Spirit, is going to show you beyond a shadow of a doubt what truth is. One of the ways we know is that we will have total peace with our decision. When we're living in God's will, we have total peace. It's interesting that Christ dedicated the book of Revelation to his servants, his followers. There's no indication anywhere in Revelation that anybody else will understand the book of Revelation. Did you know that? Only his followers will understand the book of Revelation. And the secret to understanding spiritual matters is found in Daniel 12, 10. And it says this, none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, is that pretty clear about who's going to understand the book of Revelation? What promises did Jesus give to those who obey his word? There are two texts here. First is Revelation 3.10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. 
Do you see the earth, do you see the whole world in tor- turmoil around this? Turn the news on if you don't believe me. But are we to be fearful when God has clearly promised us that he will keep us in the hour of trial? We shouldn't even give it a thought. And second, Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Heaven is beyond our imaginations. There's absolutely nothing in this world worth missing heaven for. Nothing. That includes our children. That includes every possession we've got. That includes nothing is worth missing heaven. And we know because we believe the Bible that God is preparing for us a place. And if God prepares it, I can hardly wait to see it. How about you?